and thank you for joining us. And thanks to the Royal College of Midwives for giving us this opportunity to talk about the PRAM project and how we feel it can be used to help maternity services assess and hopefully improve their postnatal care. First, some introductions. I'm Helen Cheen, Royal College of Midwives in Scotland, Professor of Midwifery. With me is John Bowers, Hello. Professor in Management Science here at University of Stirling. Working with us on the PRAM project was quite a diverse group with expertise in midwifery, management and health economics. So this morning we plan to tell you briefly about how PRAM works, how it was developed. We'll show you an example just working through the various stages of the process with some comments from folk who've already used PRAM in their area. So firstly, why, why was PRAM developed? Well, you'll all be aware that maternity services across the UK currently face the twin problems of improving both the quality and efficiency of care in the context of increased financial pressures as well as increasing demand, both through increasing birth rates in some areas and from more women experiencing uh, more complex pregnancies. So the challenge for maternity service managers and clinicians is to determine which aspects of maternity services can be safely reconfigured or reduced to enable required cost savings without compromising the safety and quality of care. And in undertaking the PRAM project, we wanted to address the question, how can postnatal care be efficiently redesigned, enabling cost savings, while ensuring that the right care is provided to the right mothers and babies at the right time and place. So what is PRAM? Well, it's a decision support tool that can be used to help midwives, service managers and other stakeholders to redesign their local postnatal care service. In de developing PRAM, we've tried to move away from a one-size-fits-all approach and we've distinguished broad categories of care needs for mothers and babies. And in working through the PRAM process, clini clinicians, managers develop various care pathways and then by getting feedback on costs and quality implications of their choices, they can make trade-offs until they have developed the best option for their local area. But while PRAM is a computer-based tool and it does pr produce objectives, objective outputs, we feel that much of the benefit of using PRAM is gained from getting the right staff together in a series of two or three workshops to work with the PRAM team, essentially with John and I, uh, to work through the process together. Workshops need to involve all the key staff involved in organising, delivering, paying for and experiencing postnatal care. So we suggest bringing together midwives, maternity service leads, managers and service users. First, they need to agree a common vision. Then, collect local data to understand what's happening in the current service. And finally, coming together again to discuss and agree on the best local options for going forward. We have used PRAM in a couple of sites so far. And these are the sorts of things people have said about the experience of using PRAM. So it, it makes you look in detail at what you possibly have taken for granted. It focuses the mind. It puts postnatal care on the agenda. Looking at, at your current service in quite a close detail does unearth, help you to unearth some things that maybe aren't working in the way that you think they are. And uh, quite importantly, people have said that it helps to argue the case for the importance of postnatal care and your services uh, better. So before we move on to showing some examples of how PRAM works, we just wanted to say a little bit about how it was developed. Firstly, we undertook case studies in three study sites, two in Scotland and one in England. We conducted interviews with a wide range of staff and interviews also with mothers and questionnaires with mothers. And we used this data to create pathways describing existing postnatal care. We then looked at models of postnatal care internationally and undertook literature reviews aiming to identify the evidence base or lack of it for what works in postnatal care. Then using computer-based systems analysis, as well as a series of workshops with midwives, medical staff, managers, service users, basically anybody that we could get to come along, we discussed uh, the evidence and as well as the models that we developed and 
uh, developed alternative postnatal care pathways. So I'm just going to hand over to John. Hello, yes, uh, this is very much a collaborative venture with um, Helen providing the experience, the expertise in maternity care, uh, and myself and some colleagues providing uh, our abilities in terms of health economics, logistics, trying to understand the cost and quality implications of different ways of organising postnatal care. So we'd like to take you through an example of how PRAM is used. It's based upon typical data from our experience in the case study sites. And as Helen says, so what we do is we're, we're not trying to suggest that there's a one-size-fits-all fit all model of postnatal care at all. But what we have done is we've identified four categories with different pathways, different care needs provided by different organisations of their care in hospital and in the community. And along those pathways, then, we look at the resource allocations, how the staff are allocated across time. Having done that, we then come up with an assessment of the quality and the cost implications. And I think this is most important, that we are combining quality and cost, which can help provide a very strong argument to commissioners, for example. And this is based very much upon a review of the evidence, both from the literature and also various local studies which we've undertaken, and we've included various expert opinions in this. So the objectives, undoubtedly, are to try to improve quality while at the same time reducing costs, and sometimes that might be possible. Typical kind of, kind of policies which we look at using PRAM is that of reducing the hospital stay and staff, reducing the resource input in the hospital setting, saving some money but reinvesting some of that money in the community. Now before John goes on to um, give more detail about how PRAM works, I just wanted to say something about these um, for PRAM care levels, well the first thing you might notice on this slide is that there actually are five levels. As John said, we wanted to move away from the typical one-size-fits-all approach and recognise that not all mothers and babies need exactly the same care. These categories are relatively broad and of course each individual mother and baby has their own specific care needs, but in broad service level planning terms, we felt these categories allow for some tailoring of care and some planning of overall pathways without getting too complicated. So the first two categories, uh, 0A and B, uh, represent very normal healthy mothers and babies. The only distinction there is that, that category B mothers need some extra support, say for feeding and parenting. Levels 1 and 2 are mothers and babies with increasingly complex care needs. And level three mothers would only be those mothers who really need one-to-one -one care. Uh, and as we felt, there would be very, very few of those by the time we actually come to postnatal ward and community care. In general, as we go through the model, you'll see that we've, we've amalgamated levels two and three. Okay, so to explain Pram, we thought we'd start at the end rather than the beginning. And the end is represented by this output chart. So what we're aiming to do is to try to assess both cost and quality. So along one axis of the chart, we've got the cost per mother. Now this is just the cost in terms of postnatal care, not the whole maternity care. And along the other axis, we've got a quality score, some kind of magical number here, we see 50, 60, 70, 80. And yes, it could go up to 100, where 100 would represent absolutely perfect, the, the most quality you possibly imagine if you had infinite resources available. So we're not saying that 60 is bad, 70 is good, it's all about relative scores here. And we've got these four categories which we consider whereby we've amalgamated care categories two and three in the last one, the enhanced care, because there's so few category three mothers who will be dealt with under the normal uh, postnatal care system. So we see, for example, that the green triangles, we've got the solid green triangle, that's for the mothers in the category routine care 0A, they've got a quality score of 65 and a cost per mother of uh, about £900. And we can then consider a change, a change to the way in which we allocate resources between the categories and also between hospital and community care. And so the second set of plots here with the circles now, this represents a new service following those changes, 
And what do we see? Well, categories one, two, and th one, two, and three, we see a big shift. With category two and three, the quality score has increased quite dramatically. Similarly, for additional care category one, smaller increase for the category 0A and 0B mothers. So we see a substantial increase in quality and also a small decrease in cost. A small decrease? Well, in fact, the estimate we come up with is a figure of £4,186,191. I wouldn't believe that number exactly, but it indicates a, a useful potential saving. But you're quite reasonably asking, well, how on earth do you arrive at this result? And we now want to very quickly take, take you through this process, but it will be quite quick. And if you've got more detailed questions, we'd be pleased to answer them sometime later. So in terms of specifying the input, we think of, first of all, the basic demand. How many births are there per year? Sometimes you will combine one or two wards together. But here we've got an example of 3,500 births per year. And then we have to think about the categories. How do they fall into the different categories of routine care, additional care, enhanced care? And we've got percentages. Now, very often, this kind of data isn't readily available. And so certainly collecting this data is an important first step. But it, it is a very valuable first step, we would argue, to actually think about how many mothers you have in each of these categories. We then got an estimate of the length of stay for the typical mother in each of those categories. So 30 hours for routine care, 0A, 0B, 42 hours for additional care, level 1, 60 hours for the enhanced care, category 2 and 3 mothers. Again, those figures are probably going to be approximate estimates, but what's important is to check that this overall figure of an average of 48 hours per mother for all the categories corresponds to the hospital data which you have. We then have estimates of the staffing. We've got the staffing on the day shift, the night shift, we distinguish the midwives, maternity care assistants. We've also got feeding and parenting staff, both on the day shift and night shift. So we specified all that data describing the resources allocated for the hospital care. We then go through the same process thinking about community care. So here we've got the mothers moving into the community. By this point, there's fewer of them in enhanced categories so two and three, for example. They would tend to be sort of kept in hospital until they didn't have such a high level of acuity. And then we have for each day, whereby day one is one day after birth, so the mothers are all in hospital still. Day two, the routine care 0A and 0B mothers have gone home, and they have a phone contact with the mother in this description of a current level of service, taking 10 minutes. So what we are doing here is specifying the typical care received by the mothers in each of these categories in terms of what kind of contact is it, a phone, a clinic visit or a home visit, what kind of staff are they, midwife or maternity care assistant, and the duration of that contact. We do also consider the service infrastructure, things like the patient record format, the appointment system, the continuity care, but we don't have time to talk about that in, in this presentation. So we've got the inputs in terms of how the resources are deployed across the categories between hospital and the community. But then how do we translate that into the effect on the quality? Well, we have this quality impact matrix, which I'll very briefly describe, but long here we've got some of the key design variables. What can you change in your system? The length of the hospital stay, for example. How many staff you have per patient? What's the percentage of midwives compared to maternity care assistants? Similarly, we've got the design variables for the community and also these infrastructure variables. And they all have an impact, potentially, on the various quality domains. And we use the international quality domains of safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, equity, and timeliness. We don't have the opportunity here to discuss what we mean by patient-centered in terms of postnatal care, but it's important to make sure that these terms, these quality domains, are translated into language that does relate to postnatal care. Then, based upon extensive searching of the evidence, then using experts' judgments, we then summarize the evidence in terms of an entry in this matrix. So, for example, here, the number of feeding and parenting contacts is generally thought to be most important in terms of the effectiveness of the postnatal care. 
So we summarize this with a, a simple number, plus two indicating sort of strong effects, plus one, a moderate effect, zero, no effect. And I, okay, I suppose you could have negative effects, but hopefully that's not the case. So this quality impact matrix, we have entries across here, summarizes all this evidence and provides the basis for translating the design variables into their impact on the quality domains. So we've got the resources we allocated, we've got the resource quality impact matrix, and that's what lies behind our initial assessment here for our current service, option A, in terms of these quality domains, and we've got a score for each quality domain, potentially from zero up to 100, for each of the categories of mothers and babies. And as a brief summary of in this particular example, category two and three mothers, babies experience poorer care relative to their needs across all quality domains. Patient centeredness seems to be pretty poor for all mothers. And you can then come up with an overall quality index that combines all of these in one number. This overall quality index, index weights the different quality dimensions. It might well be that you think that safety is the most important, so that might be worth 50% of the weighting, effectiveness 30%, with only 5% for equity and timeliness and 10% for patient centeredness. But you can adjust that depending upon your local priorities. And this then gives rise to the overall assessment of the current service which we see. So we're using those weights to produce an aggregate quality measure in each category. The total cost, we won't go into the cost calculations, but it comes out to be £4,500,000 for the £3,500 per birth for postnatal care. But then assessing this output, you might then think, well, couldn't we improve the quality of care, particularly for categories one, two, and three? that red triangle and that yellow triangle. So a possible package of actions might be to say, well, let's reduce the hospital stay if possible and the staffing and enhance the community care. We can reduce the cost through having a shorter hospital stay for mothers and babies. We can have some reduction in the staffing, but maybe an increased use of maternity care assistant, assistance. And then invest some of those savings in enhanced community care, particularly more home visits for some categories of mothers with greatest need, and also feeding and parenting support for all. So we go back and then we change our allocation of resources. So here for option B, we're then saying reduce stay for all categories. Some of the evidence suggests that that can be achieved without too much impact on quality. Reduction in the total staffing, but more maternity care assistance. And also what's important to note is that we're still retaining quite a lot of stuff. We're not reducing them proportionately to the length of stay. It means a mother's experience will be that there's more staff per bed, more a shorter stay, but with more intensive care. And also more feeding and parenting support for all. We also change the allocation of resources in the community. So for option B, this proposal for the new service, we've got an additional home visit for all categories. A further home visit for category two and three on day six. A replacement clinic for those category zero A, zero B mothers rather than the home visit on day six. And a longer final home visit for category one, two and three mothers. So how does this and feeding and parenting support, we have a clinic for all. So how does this all add up? But again, looking at the effect on the different quality domains, first of all, for this improved service for option B, the model suggests significant improvements in effectiveness for all categories, some reduction in safety for category zero mothers, but an increase for category one, two, and three. Some reductions in timeliness, equity, and patient centeredness, again, for the category zero mothers, but categories one, two, and three experience the largest improvement at all. So there's been a, a redistribution of the quality of care. The overall assessment, taking into account those weights, what do we think is most important, mm -hmm. then we can produce an overall summary as a result of reallocating resources from the hospital to the community and also between the categories. What we see is that categories one, two, and three have a significant increase in quality. Category zero, small increase because of improvements in some quality domains, the total cost that much lower, about a saving of about 7%. So that's the tool, very briefly.
so just in closing, we just uh, we have used PRAM in one or two areas, and, and this is just some of the things that, that people have said again. So the key thing folk have said is that using the model, breaking everything down the way John has explained, does prompt folk to think in a systematic manner about postnatal services. It gives you feedback on the possible consequences along the whole pathway. So John has shown you one potential pathway option, but of course you get the feedback on that. If you don't like it, you make a new pathway and we go through the process again. So in that way, you might start with options B, but you might end up with options C, D or E before you come to one that you particularly like. PRAM doesn't always involve result in an innovative redesign, but it does provide a mechanism for communicating the care you're providing and why in a more effective manner. And these are just some quotes from, from folk who've used it.